and welcome to another episode of Candor Beach. Uh, we are on episode 23 today and today we are going to be talking about the business of gaming. My personal experience with gaming started when I was three, four years old uh, with my gaming console. How about you, Silesh? I, um, if I have to remember, I think it was uh, me playing Lion King and The Prince. Yeah, I love you know, those, those games. Those Dangerous Dave too. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, and um, I remember we used to play Aladdin. Um, yeah. Aladdin too, yeah, so phenomenal games. Good times, man. Yeah, so there was there were those home consoles that like I, I think I personally associate with that we had Bomberman, Contra, and I don't remember what mm-hmm. else. And then you had your computer games. So I think like as an industry, we had arcade games. That was before our time. Mm-hmm. Then Mm, you had your home gaming consoles, your Nintendos and such, like with those Game Boys. You had computer games. That's the Prince of Persia. It was just Prince. Prince, Prince of Persia, whatever. Dangerous Dave, Doom. All of those games came in. And then you had online gaming back in in the 2000s, like with cartoonnetwork.com or whatever, launching their own website-oriented games. Like I remember it come back from school. Yeah, that's Tom and Jerry. I remember I'd come back from school at like 2 p.m. and then I'd like get on CartoonNetwork.com and then start playing these games after lunch. And then today, gaming's just exploded. Like we have e-gaming and there are prize pools worth millions of dollars. Yeah. It's insane. So huge, right? So $180 billion industry. It's bigger than, you know, uh, music and and uh, movies <laughs> combined. That, 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 is, that is hard to imagine, but... What do you think? Like, why is that? So if you look at it, gaming, like there are two parts to it, right? So there's gaming, which you go play online on, you know, like Call of Duty or whatever. And then there is the the other part to it, which is esports. Esports is basically like you go uh, championships, go on uh, tournaments and basically win prizes. This is massive amounts of money. People go play, you know, certain kind of games online and they compete this competitive uh gaming is esports so a lot of people get uh don't know the difference so that's why i wanted to start it off with that sure so so when you have a competitive gaming you know there is a lot of revenue which generates it so you have these tournaments the organizing of tournaments and you have people who are coming from all across the world to participate in gaming they are reward very well certain Certain gamers are actually given high, um, <clears throat> they are uh, like when they win prizes, these are they're huge eye watering sums. They're eye watering sums, like yeah. honestly. Uh, and I, I used to play Dota f- uh, up until a few years ago, maybe earlier this year as well. <laughs> Keep going back to that game, but yeah, it's just that Steam at some point in time, mm-hmm. Valve at some point in time had a price pool of 10 million, 15 million, 20 million. But mm-hmm. it hasn't been consistent, and we can talk about uh, potential downfalls as well. But then it's it's really exploded. Like Age of Empires by Microsoft was such a huge game. Mm. Uh, I remember playing Age of Empires two all the time. And then they came out with Age of Empires three, and then the very Rise recently, of Rise of Nations separate game. Nation. Separate game. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but then, I, I thought they were all the same. Mm, not a gamer guys when i was (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh, but more recently they came out with age of empires 4 like after a 20 year Mm -hmm. hiatus or something of that sort and it's really taken off they're doing they're doing sports uh like the same e-gaming system there's this caster that i watch ozzy drongo it's hilarious you should check him out but yeah Mm -hmm. it's like e-gaming has really exploded so what has Sorry, like one last thing. Like, but I, I think yeah. e-gaming has exploded not just because like people like playing the game, but more from the uh, aspect of the audience. Like people like watching mm-hmm. games. I think. Which. I think there was a exactly like in twenty seventeen there were mm. six sixty million people watching Twitch and YouTube. Yeah. So, I I would say like one thing is Twitch. I I like to watch Twitch. Just you know I've been on Twitch many times watching uh, gameplays, right? So 
you take gameplay. First thing is a lot I'm of people watch gameplay. Oh my god. <laughs> Like, a lot of people watch it to actually better their gameplay, right? So, you know, what are they using? What are the techniques they're using? How to maneuver the map? You know, for example, if we take, um, you know, Call of Duty, a lot of people are streaming that. And you know how you go watch certain gameplays. And they are fantastic maneuver maneuverabilities with these people. So that is one of the biggest reasons Twitch exploded. You know, like, if you look at Twitch... I've seen so and and then along with that you get uh you know the marketing the ad revenue comes with the Twitch so it's a a secondary portion of gaming right so you have regular gaming you have people spending money with uh, the gaming buying the game and playing online and then you have the secondary market which is the Twitch which actually generates a lot more revenue or you know adds to the revenue to along with uh, the gaming perspective you know so that is yeah. that is a major 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 uh, revenue generator like uh, the, especially Twitch so so coming back to it right so what, you know what? what Twitch doesn't like historically i think Google does a little a better job, I, I believe, like in paying its uh, content creators. So there are people mm -hmm. who make that YouTube versus Twitch argument, but yeah, like Amazon owns Twitch, just as an FII. Sure, uh, but I've seen better gameplays on uh, Twitch than on YouTube. It's, yeah, because Twitch is more game. Toys, yeah, yeah, Twitch was more gaming oriented. So a lot of people who yeah. have been gaming for a while, I think they had this preference with. Twitch and then Amazon went in and bought it and I don't know how the revenue structure has changed like I don't want to speak to that but uh, again like the, I have heard certain creators talk about how they have more ad revenue or more transparency with YouTube as opposed to Twitch and therefore they stick with whatever like not as important but go ahead yeah so coming back to it what 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 do you think about um, this new explosion of fashion uh, brands? You know, integrating with uh, these gaming. You know, like you have uh, I think it's Balenciaga just, actually. I think it's just on, getting uh, into the fad. I think it's getting into the fad. Yeah. Like gamers today, I we spoken about this in a few podcasts, a few podcasts back, right? Like in yeah. the other segment, the the weekend by us. So yeah. In that, we talked about how luxury brands have started targeting gamers. I think it's because mm -hmm. it's such a massive market, like a, like you mentioned, one eighty billion dollars, such a massive market, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's a market that can afford luxury today. So apparel companies, yeah. re, like everybody, wants a piece of gamers today. Also, I think so with the with technology getting better, with the rise of the metaverse, or what have you, like mm -hmm. depending on whether you care about the metaverse or not, rise of immersive experiences, the better CPUs, better GPUs, better edge edge computing, you are going to get more uh, more of a, an audience for the visual stuff. And the gamers have been consumers of visually rich media for decades now. So I think that's, yeah. that's partially influenced it. Like this is a large audience, an untapped audience. Yeah, huge. Um, I was reading this article. Um, you know, Balenciaga uh, was in partnership with Fortnite, right? So, you know, in Fortnite, when you jump off the airplane, uh, you, you wear a, uh, like a backpack. So, Balenciaga, you can actually... Can you get um, a Balenciaga you know, backpack? Yeah, the, you can adjust your character with a Balenciaga um, backpack. Skins. And you can even buy it on... Yeah, yeah, the, on the skin. So No, 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 I they're mean, called skins, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I know their skin, but what I'm saying is you are basically nudging people to buy these backpacks outside in life, too. You're ah, wearing, yeah. you know, like, so you have a, a user experience where your your character is wearing this backpack. You're going to imagine yourself wearing that backpack, right? So you're going to go outside. Yeah, why not? I check it out. Yeah, I had that in the game. I've had friends who bought like that. So, so that is... That is a another uh, you know a nudge kind of way to improve sales. It also fits in with the ecosystem that NFTs were trying to propagate back when mm -hmm. uh, NFTs were a fad again, right? Like back when NFTs were 
uh, front and center of things. You could exchange mm-hmm. your NFT for a real life. I forget who did this, but like you, they made NFT socks, and you could exchange that for uh, like a pair of socks in the real world. So yeah. exactly the same experience. And then like you've had instances where. I think it comes down to experience. I was thinking about the board apes. I remember you bringing that up, like yeah. Justin Bieber's board ape. Um, but like one point three mil to seventy three thousand. Yeah, man, that that hurts. But yeah, it's a it, pain. So what had happened with the board apes was that you could buy this digital asset, and if you owned this digital yeah. asset, you could redeem a real world experience with it you had it was a yacht club so it wasn't just a digital experience like because you have a board ape you can access a lounge or what have you within the board yacht board ape yacht club website but they also had real world parties like if you own this product you could attend these parties so i think like if i were a fashion retailer that or an apparel retailer or whatever like whatever business there is i would see that sort of a value yeah, it it uh, it's actually fantastic. Actually, the 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 idea behind it. So, you bring in something in the game, and people are motivated to buy uh, that product, even in real life. So, mm-hmm. that's something like Lacoste did it with. Uh, I think with Fortnite too. Lacoste and Fortnite did a co- uh, collaboration too. So Fortnite's had an insane you, number of collaborations, right? Like they've also had one yeah. with Ariana Grande, Nicki Minaj, like. Perform, yeah, um, yeah, Ar- Ariana Grande skins, yeah, character skins, yeah. No, she performed like again. Yeah, she the performed COVID. in the in the game itself. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So yeah, Fortnite is huge collab, um, collab land. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, what what are your thoughts about these? Uh, you know, the consolidation of these gaming industries. You know, all these acquisitions and you know you, major i'm glad you bring that up because it speaks to the industry it mm-hmm. typically when an industry starts up you have it, you have it in fragments like when social media mm-hmm. first came into being like first came to the forefront you had messengers you had like when i say messengers i'm talking about aol msn uh, yahoo then you had your individual social media platforms you had facebook you had orkut you had uh, Google Plus come up, you had, you got Twitter, you got a bunch of these platforms. And what do you see today? You see consolidation. You see companies Mm. like Facebook buying everything. Sorry, pardon me, Meta buying everything. WhatsApp, Instagram, what have you, is just rolled under Meta. Similarly, you see other companies doing the same thing. Snaps try to do that. And what that essentially is an example of is industry consolidation so as an as your industry matures you start consolidating fragmentation become yields to a few players now this isn't mm-hmm. necessarily creating a monopoly this isn't anti-competition but it is necess- it, it is what happens like with microsoft buying activism that was that was a conversation that happened right like is this going to be uh, anti-competition yeah so yeah. you, you start to see those conversations come in, like with more and more acquisitions, you are going to see these com- conversations, like are there too few players, like with the app stores as well, Apple and Google, there are only two app stores and therefore that's a problem we should introduce more. And uh, countries like India, countries like um, Europe are um, currently uh, uh, legislating towards restricting that. but. That brings me back to uh, Microsoft acquiring acquisition, uh, uh, Activision. Activision, massive company, Blizzard, uh, has Warcraft, yeah. has Spider-Man, I think. Like if I remember correctly, like I remember playing Spider-Man and it popping up, Activision. Uh, they've acquired Zenimax as well. So the Elder Scrolls, Wolfenstein, uh, Fallout, all of them now fall under Microsoft. Why is Microsoft doing this? Do you... I- so what I um, kind of think, if you look at it, most of these studios, right, they're all under basically about seven major companies, right? So you have Microsoft, Sony, Ubisoft, uh, Tencent, T2, uh, T2, and I believe... Um, you T2 know, is um, Take-Two? 
Yeah, t- uh, take two, yeah. and you have uh, Embracer, right? So, what prob the the biggest problem is like You're you said the competition, Nintendo. right? Yeah, and Nintendo. Um, so what I'm saying is, what if these companies bring games which are uh, specific to only their uh, platforms and not giving uh, to the other platform like you know like uh, that, Nintendo does it with Mario that hits uh, hits to the heart of the issue so mm. did you know when Microsoft first started with like the push to uh, game into gaming they tried to break it break into Japan but they couldn't and that was because yeah. a lot of game creators a lot of good game creators at that point in time like when when the industry was still fragmented, still developing, a lot of them were in Japan, and these people mm. refused to collaborate with Microsoft because they were already with either Sony or with Nintendo, yeah. and that was why. Well, the PlayStation did very well in uh, in Japan. The Xbox just didn't. Like the Xbox globally yeah. was fine. So what what the conversation there was that. Microsoft didn't have content exclusivity. Microsoft didn't have those titles that really sold, that attracted people to buying into their platform, which is why people just stuck with, like as a consumer, I'm going to go to the platform where I can play what I want to play. Whereas Microsoft Mm. just didn't have that. They didn't command that. And there was also this whole, like there are companies that are decades old and Microsoft is a relatively newer player. So there was this whole, yeah, there was there was a little bit of tradition. There was a little bit of respect that Microsoft hadn't incorporated into its style at that point in time, and that's something that they're trying to change today. Which is where you see, like, when you're acquiring these companies, like we talked about Activision, Zenimax, and such, you're essentially getting into your fold a library, a content, uh, a, li- a library of content that people want to play, and that makes your platform ex- uh, attractive. Now, hmm. Microsoft says that they do not want to restrict supply to other platforms but there are going to be other advantages that microsoft is going to uh, exploit like i might as an example supply it to playstation like whatever world of warcraft is also going to be available to playstation and in xbox in addition to pc pc is primarily dominated by microsoft windows right yeah so microsoft's happy now with playstation you still get the game but maybe at a slightly higher expense and Microsoft could just justify it by saying, oh, I have, I don't know, these synergies, therefore it's simpler for me to offer it on Xbox and not PlayStation. So it'll be available on both platforms, but it's going to be more expensive on one platform. So Microsoft's keeping their word, but at the same time, and this is speculative. It's not like Microsoft said this. Another thing is Microsoft's uh, the leader in uh, cloud gaming. So you have your, yeah. you have, uh, you have your consoles, you have your cloud gaming. So with the Xbox, they just introduced this Xbox Pass where you could play whatever game you felt like. You just had to subscribe to this. Yeah. So subscription was fantastic. Obviously, like it's a uh, it's a base that you can that you can build upon. It's not like a like back in the day, people may or may not buy your title. Now people are paying for that title irrespective. So they are more likely to find more games they're more likely to try out more content they're a a reliable revenue base to an extent now those are things that microsoft is going to use to maybe beat its competition out sorry you had a question so what my um like what bothers me is like so for example all these companies go flat uh, platform specific right Mm -hmm. so and i have to end up buying uh, if I want to play a certain game, I have to end up buying PlayStation and Xbox. To... Or not play that game at all. That's an option. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's not an option for being a good gamer. So if you want to uh, play that game, you got to own both the consoles, right? Rise so, of Nations unless I... is not Age of Empires. Um, good me, game. Yeah, my mistake. <laughs> no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So if you think if you think that way, it's going to raise a lot of costs on the the end consumer itself. If you're talking about the business perspective. No, which is why micro, companies like Microsoft make statements like it will be available. I'm not going to pull the pull the catalog from another from my competition. And therefore, it's not anti-competition. 
like that anti monopoly sure. um, thing is going to be a play I, like i said like yeah, if i were I microsoft i would just charge you a little more and dissuade you from buying a playstation over an xbox if i could because but at the same time i don't want to cut off revenue for that game right like if what if you don't buy into my xbox pass for world of warcraft or spider man what if you want to play it on playstation and if you it's not available it's not available so the game suffers and that's revenue that i had planned in through my acquisition that i'm no longer getting microsoft does not want to make another nokia play yeah 40 yeah, billion I down agree. the drain right like that's not something that i want to keep yeah. doing so microsoft yeah. paid what 70 75 billion for 75 billion for activism they're not going to they're not going to f around with that catalog 65 billion or something but yeah they they raised a lot of uh, red flags with ftc um you know the ftc sued microsoft uh, and they lost the case and microsoft 75 billion uh, won the loss it was 75 mm-hmm. okay i thought That's it was 65 so yeah, I mean, yeah, the, there was a um, you know it raised a lot of uh, anti-competition laws um, issues with American uh, FTC, you know, Federal Trade Commission, when Microsoft went and tried to buy uh, Activision. So that was a huge issue. Like when these kind of companies start consolidating, uh, the um, regulatory uh, bodies were going to come after them. So I don't know about Sony so much because it's based off in Japan. I don't know how the regulatory structure in Japan is, but um, Microsoft did, you know, had all these red flags raised because of their buying uh, Activision. What are, what are your thoughts on that? What do you think um, uh, raising red flags like that will do for future acquisitions of other companies? I think I've been speaking to that point for a while. Uh, it's a natural course. Because when mm-hmm. industries mature, you are going to see consolidation. You are going to see fewer players. And the primary constraint in the gaming market is who has what. So okay. you are more likely to see uh, see anti-competition uh, lawsuits. But at some point in time, you could say that that's just something that people tend to do now. Like, are you inconvenienced yeah. by the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store? You want to introduce a third-party thing? That's fine. Like, yeah. um, I mean, there are instances, there are issues, right? Like Apple and Google charge whatever they feel like. That's a thirty percent, and now yeah. they've changed that structure after after a lawsuit. I think a lawsuit with uh, with Fortnite uh, parent company, Epic Games. The Epic Games, yeah. Right. Epic Games had a lawsuit with Apple, which actually caused them to change the structure. Yeah, yeah, like I Apple mean, won out, but Epic Games, uh, like, but Apple still was like, yeah, but we'll look into the revenue structure. If that's that that big an issue, so like they do it for your safety. Like Apple says that they have this app store where you can download what you are putting onto your device, considering the fact that it's still safe. Like it's not it's not going to have malware. Now, yeah, that's not something they can guarantee on a third party store. So similarly, you're so, going to have these. You're going to have these issues. It depends upon how much you trust the brand. It depends upon how much you care for the content that they're pushing out. But to your point, I believe you are more likely to see this in maturing industries. Yeah. Uh, so we we talked about the fashion industry. We talked about consolidation gaming. We talked about so, fashion as well. Yeah. So let's talk about gamification. The game mechanics. What are your, um, what, uh, what is leading uh, gamification in the present world? Fundamentally, I would say it is the thought of getting a reward. Like every game, it rewards you in some form or the other. Like either through victory or through progress, um, and this could be measured in a variety of ways. Like with contra, like each villain or like each. Uh, non-playing character I killed or with World of Warcraft like every time I leveled up I was a little yeah. happier so the anticipation of these rewards it gives you a dopamine hit and you're happier like there is like when you achieve something serotonin contentment so I think that those are your primary drivers like with with social media as well right like every time someone engages with you you are a mm-hmm. little happier you're going to see that like you have you have been seeing that with gaming for all of these years so I think those are your primary biological factors, but how games are designed is where I think UX components like your human centric biases come in, human centric yeah. designs and biases come in. So 
So yeah, look at look at some of the examples. We have the frequent fly, flyer miles. That's a, a gamification, incentivization, right? Credit card uh, reward points, something something like that is also gamification in present day. You know, real life examples. If you're talking about, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. So there was this one example that I was discussing. Uh... We were so consulting, like I, I work as a consultant, that's my day job. And uh, there were instances that I was talking, discussing with my team about how there was this one, uh, I think Indonesian or Philippines, like somewhere in Southeast Asia, there was this mall, then they created an app which replicated the mall, like the environment, mm. and you could log in and then you could water the trees and plants in and around the place, like small actions that you could take. And you'd be rewarded mm. for that, like for those daily logins. And you could mm. use these rewards to buy goods like milk, as an example. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So what does it do? It creates like now this app, this mall is top of mind. Mm. So I automatically and these rewards, if they're only redeemable within this app or within the, uh, the, the scope of the mall somehow, it creates a certain degree of stickiness. It also yeah. gives me that excitement to come in and think about the brand every day. So brand recall is impacted, loyalty is impacted. Gamification is crazy, like very, very powerful. I mean, think about it. Yeah, the other day you were telling me um, that you, how you can have multiple cards, but you'll try to spend on one particular card to uh, increase your yeah. reward points on one card. And, you know, you can actually use them later on. This is a real life example we were talking the other day. <laughs> yeah. It's buying plane tickets. Yeah. So, so you increase gamification is in it's intense, uh, incentivizing you to use a particular card in real life. I don't know if, um, yeah, I guess you could call it gamification there. I didn't think of it as gamifi gamification, but there is the scope of rewards. So it is. Yeah. So. What are you using the rewards for? You're using it for your um, use, right? Later on, you're using the rewards, the miles. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not arguing with you on this. It's just that <laughs> it's a, a like my mind found it a little tenuous to begin with, but sure. Well, yeah. So, what other questions you got for me, Ashish? Where do you think all of this is headed? Where do you think the industry is headed? It um so so if you look at it the the younger generations actually like the game like if you look back so our parents were like oh don't play too many games and all that stuff right so now there's a career out of it exactly <laughs> so you have a game developer you have a game uh, tester you have um you know a bunch of stuff you have multiple careers out of it no no i and... mean like from playing games in itself not just creating yeah, it sure it's sure but yeah um, to what you're speaking about the ecosystem it's insane yeah so the mindset is changing right you actually uh show these you know the the older parents like this is the uh, this is the route the younger kids can take. You, uh, they can be um, gaming isn't isn't all that bad as they claim to uh, be, you know. So there is the shift which we can actually work on. Yeah, uh, so, I get yeah. that. But also, like, if you could speak to the technology as well, like with the Vision Pro coming in, with Quest Meta coming in, with the Metaverse oh, yeah. kicking in, what are your thoughts there? Like, will companies pick it up in general? Like the examples that you talked about with reward points. Do you see companies like fashion brands coming in, picking it up? And like, there are already a few games that are being created. There are a few apps that are being created uh, using generative AI and fashion as an example. Or what do you see? Basically? It's just going to take some incentivization to cause the stickiness, right? So if you were um, taking a product, they have to uh, metaverse. This is going to come eventually. It's going to come. Like people, like uh, for example, if you look at in India, remember when uh, the super app started, right? Like uh, there was this super app called Tata New, and they started offering a bunch of rewards compared to other super apps, and people started flocking towards them. 
So something like that will actually cause, you know, um, you know, it, for people to stick on to metaverse or, I mean, so basically I understand the difference, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's a door. terrible answer, honestly. Sure, you could take it I that t- way. I tell but... you why. Because everything okay, runs right. on incentives. If you say that incentives drive something, I'm like, can't argue with that. Everything is driven by incentives. So, all right, sure. I mean, yeah. Uh, if I buy, uh, like, for example, probably if I buy the Vision Pro on the credit card, yeah, it's a good incentive. Reward points. So... Stuff like that <laughs> but yeah sure why not you know it's gonna take time but it's gonna um, it's gonna pick up like it's just as as gen z um and the later generations come start to use this technology they're gonna start liking it it's already it's already headed th- that direction okay uh so when i was talking about technology i wasn't just talking about vision pro because there are like google stadia had come out google stadia came out mm-hmm. they didn't see the sort of uh, user acquisition that they were hoping for and they had to shut it down. But Apple Arcade is still there and going strong because it has a reasonable user base already, right? Because people are playing games on your phone. Uh, Your iPad is getting stronger. I should just say tablets, right? Sorry. Mm. Um, Your tablets are getting stronger, more powerful. It's supporting higher graphic games. You have companies like NVIDIA and... uh, that, that are building out technologies like that support cloud gaming. So you can now use my resources for your game without having to possess sophisticated hardware. So yeah, yeah. Te- there is technology that's developing in the ecosystem that is enabling people, f- uh, allowing people to play games uh, more conveniently. So I think it's just set to explode. 180 billion is underestimating the entire industry. Yeah, a lot more to go. Probably a trillion dollar industry. Quite possibly. And I feel like yeah. different, uh, like the groups, like we talked about luxury and apparel, right? They are getting into gaming. I'm sure everybody else is also going to. Like the NFT thing, I don't believe was a failure. Like it resulted, the outcome wasn't great for NFTs, but I think conceptually it was interesting. It is, it is a reasonable use case to explore. I think that might make a comeback as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree. More industries getting bigger, uh, better technology is going to yield to more gamers. Like a third of the world was playing games in 2016. Like 2.5 billion people were playing. It was a 130 billion wonder- industry in 2018. It's a 180 billion industry. Like what is a 180 billion industry as of 2022? 2021, 2022. The COVID probably it also turbocharged the gaming industry because everybody was stuck inside, right? So, and people started playing a lot of, you know, like console games at home. Yeah, that probably and, blew up the industry too. And like, there is this whole concept of like mental health and additional stress mm. and gaming is a way that you can let out some of that stress. So yeah, definitely expanding industry. <laughs> For sure, it's um, and we should uh, probably uh, another topic. We'll probably uh, talk about uh, ga- the uh, gaming addictions, you know, so, and the biases which is next gaming time cause on like, Candor Beach. I'm starting to imitate that yeah. that Dragon Ball Z thing. Next time on Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, next time on. So, Candor what's Beach. our next topic? Uh, I don't want to say this is a hot topic, but everybody's talking about Israel, Gaza, Hamas, Palestine. I was thinking, and this isn't something we've explored really, but the impact of war. Like, why did we sure. see a certain effect when uh, Ukraine and Russia went to war versus, or or when the U.S. and Iraq uh, uh, happened, Afghanistan, now Israel, Gaza? Like, what is the impact that you can expect expect from wars? Let's talk about that. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely, that's a good top. I like how we just <laughs> affirming ourselves. <laughs> no, I, I, I had cold for like two days. Oh. So yeah, so fantastic. Cool. Thank you for joining us, guys. Yep, we'll see you on the next one.